Hi, and welcome to the, uh, our talk today with Black Sky. Uh, today we're gonna be focused on disrupting new space with real-time dynamic monitoring. I'm Patrick O'Neill, the Chief Innovation Officer at Black Sky, and today I'm gonna walk you through what dynamic monitoring is, what Black Sky brings to the table with uh, real-time geospatial intelligence. So what's the big deal with dynamic monitoring? Um, this talk is gonna be about space-based dynamic monitoring. So being able to monitor activity as it unfolds around the planet using a combination of space sensors, ground sensors, and artificial intelligence. And why is this a big deal? Well, the National Reconnaissance Office um, recently issued Black Sky a $1 billion 10-year contract to offer our dynamic monitoring services. Uh, as you're gonna see in this talk, we're gonna walk through the hardware and the software that makes this all possible, and we're gonna dive into specific use cases about how dynamic monitoring is really changing the game when it comes to uh, how to monitor our world. So in this talk, uh, I'm gonna give you an overview of the company, I'm gonna give you an overview of some of our core capabilities, and then I'm really gonna dive into uh, use cases. So real-time crisis response, um, we have an example of uh, an application for national security um, and monitoring some emerging events around the world. We're gonna talk about how we monitor the flow of commodities as well as some business intelligence applications. Um, so Black Sky, as I mentioned, is a, is a leading provider of real-time geospatial intelligence. Uh, we do this through multi-domain sensing. This is uh, our space-based sensor network, which I'll get into, as well as ground-based sensing, uh, pulling in multi-domain data, and then running that through our geolocation uh, algorithms to create geolocated data feeds, passing that to our advanced artificial intelligence modules, which will enrich that data with additional metadata and make it um, usable for aggregation, uh, time series analysis, alerting, things like that. Uh, and then finally, I'm gonna talk about how developers and others can use Black Sky's tasking services, our archive data services, uh, in order to build their own applications through our API and web interfaces. So I've been using this term dynamic monitoring and I, I really wanna dive into what that means. So when we talk about dynamic monitoring, what we're really talking about is the shift from a static view of the world to a dynamic view of the world. Over the past couple decades, this shift has been occurring and everyone has really experienced it, from GPS-enabled applications uh, to always-on um, sensor networks and um, you know, AI that sits in your kitchen and helps you uh, with cooking. So if we take a look here on the left, the 2000s were really all about digital mapping. Very large-scale satellite systems were launched uh, that would create very large maps of the world. Uh, and this is where you get things like Google Earth, Bing Maps, things like that. Um, then GPS came into the mix and mobile devices and this really accelerated that. Now we're getting web mapping, we're getting things uh, like crowd-based um, intelligence, so being able to go in and edit some of these maps, as well as location-based intelligence. When you show up at places, uh, your device knows that you're at those places. But what we're looking to in the future is really more dynamic. All of that stuff I just mentioned is really point in time. Uh, images are collected and the maps are generated. And you're not getting much in terms of dynamic. You're not seeing how things were yesterday or earlier this morning, you're seeing how things were a month or maybe even years ago. What Black Sky is really focused on is dynamic monitoring. This means monitoring a changing world. And we do that from space because that gives us a broad uh, capability across the entire planet. Um, and then we plug in additional data sources as needed to expand that monitoring capability beyond just space-based imaging. Um, so we think of this as just-in-time intelligence. If you need an answer, if you need eyes on right now, Black Sky is the company to do that. Um, our proliferated sensor network makes that possible, and I'll get into some of the specifics and technical reasons why that's the case. Moving forward, we see this world of ubiquitous sensor networks. These are ground-based and space-based sensor networks offering real-time intelligence across a wide variety of domains and a wide variety of sensor types. Black Sky already today is integrating many of these sensor networks into our system, and a lot of the examples that you'll see are multi-source, multi-phenomenology, um, use cases where we bring in, we, we brought those data sources into our, uh, our platform and then we have run analytics on top of those to come up with derived insights. So this platform is really a key part of our, of our offering um, and it's an AI powered SaaS platform that we call Spectra AI. So Spectra AI monitors and analyzes global activity in real time across a wide variety of data sources. Uh, we have over a million observations per day pouring into our data lake and our, and our SaaS platform. 
That's coming from over 100,000 different data sources. Uh, these sources are our own proprietary um, constellation of space-based assets, but they're also things like hyper-local news sources that have been translated into English. Um, there are uh, other sensor networks that, like the U.S. government has launched, for example, on scientific missions. Uh, you'll see an example where we're using thermal data to identify active fires and then imaging those with our own system. And what that does is it distills down into about 18,000 significant events per day across a wide variety of, of themes. So you can think supply chain events, port closures, um, or backups. You can think natural disasters uh, or conflict events like uh, military mobilizations and things like that. So this data lake is ever growing. Every single day we expand it. Um, and we're gonna show where a lot of that data comes from. Um, this is taking one step deeper into this, into this uh, Spectra platform. So ultimately what we're, what we're looking to do is deliver data to you when you need it. Uh, so that means that we're delivering images along with analysis in under, nine, in under 90 minutes. Uh, that 90 minute timeline is really quite incredible um, when you consider legacy systems where, you know, if you go to Google Maps and take a look at the imagery there, you're gonna be seeing imagery from um, several months ago or, or in some cases even potentially years ago. So on the right here, we dive into what this system really looks like. Um, at the top, you can see our constellation of taskable low Earth orbit um, imaging satellites. So these satellites, we've deployed 14 of these satellites. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about the constellation on the next slide, so I won't go into super depth about this constellation, but we've designed it uh, in order to maximize what we call our revisit rate around the world. The revisit rate is how many times we pass over a single location uh, within a single day. Historically, this rate has been very low for the satellite imagery industry, but Black Sky has really changed that game, and now we're offering uh, hourly revisit rate over most of the Earth. This means that as activity occurs, you can watch and you can see changes uh, in near real time from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, and so forth. And being able to do that allows you to not just create maps, but, but, but create a real understanding of activity at facilities uh, and then ch look for changes in that baseline activity pattern. So this constellation uh, is, is active today. It's taskable today. We have customers today. Um, as I mentioned, the NRO just recently signed a billion dollar contract with us uh, to offer that service. Um, and you can task this constellation as well as a customer of Black Sky. We pull all that data down through our uh, network of ground stations, and then we bring it into our AWS environment uh, where we then process it. So on the ground, we have a significant image processing and artificial intelligence pipeline to analyze all of that data as it comes in. We distribute that data to our customers through a, through a method that they uh, deem most efficient. That could be through our Spectre AI platform, or we can directly deliver that into an Amazon S3 bucket. Uh, once that data is brought in, it goes through our real-time AI processing. Unlike um, other traditional approaches to AI uh, for satellite imagery, we run all of our AI in line with the image delivery. This is really important. If you are taking a stack of images and running a historical analysis against those images, you can't really make real-time decisions based on that. Instead, what we do is as the image comes in to a customer, it automatically is processed by our AI, extracting the indicators that they care about, and then delivered to the customer so that that data can feed right into their databases and be used in, in real-time decision-making. Um, so that gives us this real-time delivery, uh, and if, if your problem necessitates low latency operations, uh, it doesn't help to have an image that has uh, had to sit in a queue for hours and hours before it actually gets processed. Um, so we do this in Amazon uh, using a, a scalable cloud-based approach to distribute out the, the computer vision tasks as they come in uh, and then deliver those images uh, and analytics to our customers. But the other key part of this is real-time tasking. So as the situation on the ground changes, requirements for tasking change. Um, historically, you'd look at a, uh, the way that you would task a satellite and you would have a very long lead time in order to get an image. Uh, you would want to place your order, usually for a very wide area, and then you would have to wait weeks, sometimes months, to get that image. And if you're a lower priority customer, you're gonna wait a very long time. Black Sky offers a couple different modes of tasking our satellites that make it really fast uh, and easy to plug into low latency operations. 
the most direct way to task our satellites is through our Spectra AI platform, uh, which can be tasked on a phone. It can be tasked through your web browser. Uh, for more sophisticated users, we offer APIs that can plug into their applications and can plug into their um, processing chains to automatically task uh, our, our satellites um, through those APIs. And then the third way um, is something that we call tip and queue. So when you have a constellation like ours, uh, these are assets that are flying all the time. And what you want to do is identify things on the ground and update your mission plan to collect images of those emerging activities as fast as possible. If there's an earthquake or if there's a fire, a large, uh, like a wildfire, for example, you want to get eyes on as fast as you can. And if you need a human to go into our platform to place the order or you need a system to place an order through an API, that can slow things down. So what we've done is we built uh, our tip and queue system, which is going to automatically analyze a bunch of different geospatial feeds, including customer data feeds. And then from that, it's going to select which tasks it should place. So it'll see, and there'll be a few examples of this, it'll see, for example, that there's an active fire, and then it'll recognize that, hey, this is something I should take an image of. It'll automatically task our constellation, which is, is called tipping, and then that's going to queue uh, the satellite image um, collection process. So our mission plan will be updated, an image will be taken, and it'll be downlinked. That allows for completely real-time tasking, um, fed into that real-time AI processing, ultimately giving you real-time delivery and the ability to make decisions right away. Okay, so let's take a second to dive into this uh, constellation of imaging satellites that, that we built at Black Sky. Um, when we take a look at what people generally want, from a space-based imaging platform and this shift towards dynamic monitoring. We're really focused on how can we get the best bang for the buck for our customers, give them what they need as fast as they can, uh, and not break the bank in the process. So if you look at the legacy systems, which I've shown at the bottom here, these are really focused on uh, static mapping applications, which we talked about previously, taking very large images, analyzing those images to understand where are the roads, where are the buildings, where are the forests, things like that. Um, generally, that stuff doesn't change super often, so it's not the worst uh, that you don't have um, the rapid tasking and, and rapid revisit capabilities that we offer. Uh, but generally, these systems are either uh, a few very large satellites or many, many small satellites. And these satellites are also launched into polar orbits uh, or sun-synchronous orbits. And when they're in these sun-synchronous orbits, it means that they fly over the same place at the same local time every day. So. Uh, if you want to collect an image over an area that you care about, you're going to get revisits around uh, 10.30 in the morning or 1.30 in the afternoon. And you can't really get any revisits outside of that because it, the pass is synchronized with the sun. Um, this creates problems if what you want to monitor occurs in the middle of the day or at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. Um, so this, as you see here, this daily revisit, um, we have this clock here that shows fixed imaging time of day. This is really a problem for a lot of use cases that don't occur at 10.30 at, and at 1.30. It's fine for mapping because generally the road isn't going to move between 10.30 and 1.30, but if you want to understand activity over the course of a day, you can't really rely on that. And then from a capacity standpoint, uh, these satellites collect a lot of data, but very little of that data is actually what's meaningful to the customer. Um, so that, uh, the actual monetization of that imagery um, is not the best equation for what we want to do. So instead, we focus on this top line here. Uh, so we recognize that 90% of the world's GDP occurs on over less than 15% of the land mass. That means that you don't necessarily need to map the whole world. You want to map the parts of the world that really matter. Um, so today, we're offering dynamic monitoring, uh, which is what this conversation, what this talk is about. Um, over the, just the most important locations. We really focus on point target collection, site monitoring, facility monitoring, while also offering flexibility to collect larger areas uh, for some specific use cases. To do this, instead of launching hundreds of satellites or, or a few handful of very large, very expensive satellites, we've launched 14 taskable satellites. Um, these are much smaller satellites. Uh, they're small sats, um, and you can think of them like the size of a dorm fridge uh, flying in space. Uh, we've launched these into mid-inclination orbits instead of polar orbits. So if you look at the graphic on the left uh, that's showing the globe, the, the polar orbits are, uh, is the dashed line, and the mid-inclined orbits, the orbits that we launch into, is the solid line uh, with the arrow. So by doing this, you 
get the benefit of the Earth rotating underneath you as you uh, rotate around the Earth, and that increases your revisit, but also we're no longer sun synchronous. So now we can collect at six in the morning, six at night, any time in between uh, without any concern for being locked into that sun synchronous cycle. And that creates massive opportunity to analyze activity as it occurs throughout the day, not just at these peak revisit times. And also, because we're monitoring the most important sites, we find that many customers care about the same sites, um, particularly when it comes to some of the supply chain work that we do or the national security work. You have customers from all over the planet who really care about the same places, and we're collecting so many times over these places that they can get the information that they need from what we've already collected. So we're going to talk a bit about um, the archive that we're creating, the, the massive data lake, uh, and you'll see some examples of the type of data that flows into that. Uh, but this is really where we get this collect one, sell many times uh, capability that, that is really um, novel for this space. Okay. Um, launching these satellites is no easy feat. Um, there have been quite a few new launch providers, uh, as everyone is aware of, uh, that make it a little easier, but you're still launching uh, objects into space. They have to work. It's really difficult. Um, it's really hard to commission these things. Once they're up in space, you can't really do anything with them other than communicate over the radio. Uh, what I think is really, really cool um, that Black Sky was able to accomplish uh, was actually over the course of 30 days late last year, we launched six satellites from three different missions, two different launch providers, two different continents, and we brought these satellites online and delivering imagery and analytics to our customers in 18 hours. That is uh, really a game changer when it comes to not just the launch side and, and the resiliency and agility of being able to launch satellites that quickly, but then bringing them online that quickly means that if, if there's um, a need to launch additional satellites, get them up very quickly to increase our monitoring capacity, we're not launching satellites and waiting months for commissioning. We can bring them online uh, within 24 hours, within 18 hours, really, of when we launch them. So we're especially excited about that. And here's just a little fun uh, picture. I mentioned earlier that we have a tipping queue process uh, that will automatically task our constellation. Well, one of the um, scenarios with which this AI system will actually task our constellation is when there are rocket launches or missile tests, things like that. Um, it'll actually automatically identify where that launch is going to occur. Uh, it'll geolocate it, and then it will create a task in our system to go collect those images. Uh, and this is one of those situations. So um, this Falcon 9 that launched, uh, actually, it was actually launching some of our satellites, generated a tip for a collection, and that queued our, one of our other satellites to go take a picture of the launch. So what you're actually seeing here is one of our satellites collect an image of the rocket that's about to launch our other satellites. Um, and then considering that this is all AI and fully automated, there was no human in the loop here, um, it's pretty cool to see one AI basically keeping eyes on another. Okay, so I've mentioned these revisits. I've mentioned the fact that we have launched this mid-inclined orbit. Um, one key area of this is really to start analyzing what happens when you can start imaging dawn till dusk? What happens when you have 14 satellites? What you get is this really incredible rapid revisit capability. Um, so Black Sky has the ability to monitor uh, throughout the world, um, and we've really focused on adding revisit rate to our constellation uh, through the system design. So what ends up happening is you can collect over one location uh, up to 15 times a day uh, and then analyze all that information to understand the activity patterns. So here's just a quick example um, that, that works well to demonstrate this revisit. All of these images were collected in the course of the same day over seven hours. So seven collects in seven hours. Uh, you can also see our artificial intelligence that was run on all of these images not only extracted the location of the ships and the precise outlines of the ships, but also identified which ships they are. And when you combine this with some of the other analytics that we provide, you can really start to build some powerful applications for analyzing things like commodity supply flow um, and uh, disposition of assets around the world. So we actually have a video here that demonstrates just uh, how incredible this revisit is and the type of analytics that you can do with it. Um, and what I think is interesting about this for the Remars audience uh, is this is actually an Amazon warehouse facility where we analyzed 
uh, the comings and goings of uh, the Amazon cargo ships, or cargo aircraft, sorry. Once you layer on analytics on top of the imagery, you can start to build time series and then analyze the patterns in that time series to understand things like when are the most number of assets located at this location, when do they come, when do they go. Um, and as you'll also notice, this is dawn till dusk collection, so we have early morning shots as well as late afternoon shots. And getting up to nine images in this case in a single day lets you really see that hour by hour So this slide summarizes what was in that video um, on a single page over the course of a single day. Uh, and you can see how the number of aircraft changes from, from, day, uh, from hour to hour. What to me is especially interesting about this is that this level of analysis is certainly possible over one facility. But Black Sky has, from day one, built a completely automated platform. So while we can do this level of deep analysis over a single location, the system can scale to do this over thousands of locations. And we are actually monitoring thousands of locations uh, throughout the world. Um, users can log in. They can easily set up site monitoring uh, by selecting a location, selecting the analytics that they would like to run, uh, and then setting the revisit rate that they, they would like to achieve and the duration. And then that'll kick it off. Um, and that lets you do analysis like this, where you're actually seeing how things change over the course of a day. And then you can build up time series analytics on that to understand the trends in that time series, baseline the activity, and then start to identify anomalies in that activity. So if typically on a Tuesday you're used to seeing one activity pattern, and then on a particular Tuesday that you're watching it changes, that's something that we want to inform our customers about. And that's the capability that we've developed here. So this dynamic monitoring delivers this supply chain intelligence, not just for this location, uh, but for many locations like it around the world. And again, users can come in and set up the locations that matter most to them. OK, so I want to dive into a couple use cases here and, and show some of the ways that uh, this, this system that we've developed, this dynamic monitoring system, can be deployed to solve real world problems. So we're going to start with some uh, crisis response. Again, this is a situation where um, there's a major crisis that has unfolded. And our users need to know what's happening on the ground as soon as possible. We have systems in place that will actually anticipate the needs of those users and will collect before anybody even asks for it. Uh, we do this so that when a major disaster occurs, we have an image that, that was tasked by our artificial intelligence. And so when someone comes to us and says, hey, do you have an image of this? We just have to check our archive and see, did the AI collect it? Um, and if they did, we already have the image uh, ready to go. So that anticipatory collection is really key to a lot of what we do. Uh, and it really allows our customers to take advantage of the AI system that we've built. Um, and users, again, can also add their own data sets to that tipping queue system to automatically collect uh, any time maybe one of their sensors tips that there's an anomaly occurring somewhere. So the way that we do a lot of this uh, monitoring is through something uh, that we've built, uh, which is an events dashboard. This is something that's part of the Spectra AI platform, and users who have access to Spectra AI can access our events platform. Uh, here we've built a system that will pull in multi-source data from a, a variety of different um, phenomenologies, including open source text, blog posts, news reports, um, all the way to uh, government sensor systems, third-party data sen uh, sensor networks. And it will aggregate all of that. It will run it through a series of AI uh, algorithms. If it's open source text, it'll run it through natural language processing algorithms. If it's uh, thermal data coming off of uh, a NOAA sensor, for example, it'll run it through some specific algorithms for that. Um, and then it'll create uh, candidates for collection, um, as well as just events that are occurring around the world. It'll identify these events. So here what you're seeing are some examples of global disasters that are unfolding. 
around the world, uh, active fires that have been reported around the world, as well as earthquakes that are, that are being reported. And behind each of these events is actually a bunch of metadata that tells the system where this happened, when it happened, the severity of what happened, and all of that data is used to generate uh, what we call an image worthiness score. This is a score that will um, tell our satellite system what it should pay attention to and what it should prioritize for collection. So we have a couple examples here. Um, this is the volcano that erupted uh, in January. Uh, we were actually collecting this pretty consistently. Um, again, with our revisit rates, we were actually able to watch uh, as this situation unfolded. Um, again, we're able to achieve that hourly revisit, so you can really watch as things change, uh, which helps you get, get better insight into what's actually going to happen. Um, this was another situation where there was an automatic tipping queue. Uh, in this case, there was a fertilizer um, plant that um, had a major fire occur. And so here, this collection, uh, there's a couple things to note. One, it was an automated collection that was tipped off of, of news reporting of the area. But two, if you notice, this image was collected at 5.52 p.m. Uh, this is r really Im interesting and important for uh, natural disaster and, and man-made disaster scenarios. Uh, if this was a sun-synchronous collection, uh, this would have occurred the next day, uh, 10.30 or, or 1.30 in the morning. You just wouldn't have a, had a satellite overhead to take this image. Because we're in those mid-inclination orbits, we're able to get a shot at 6 p.m. Uh, on the same day that this occurred instead of waiting um, you know, hours and hours to get the data that we need. And this example, uh, we're using data from the VIRS sensor uh, in order to identify active fires around the world. We run an algorithm that will prioritize fires to collect uh, based on region uh, and impact and size. Um, and here you can see that the system automatically tasked uh, for this collection. It generated a, a tip, uh, which is the box, the call out box there that you can see, and then that tasked our satellites to take an image. Um, so this is data from one satellite system going into our Spectra AI platform and being used to tip uh, our own constellation to take a higher resolution image of, of this fire. So being able to do this in real time uh, allows data to get to first responders as they need it, not days later. Uh, they can use that for planning and response. Um, and we can also keep an eye on these things as they occur. We can get additional images with that hourly revisit. So it's not just a single point in time, it's a continuous refresh of the situation on the ground. Um, and recently, uh, we've been doing quite a bit of monitoring in Ukraine. Uh, as you can see here, this is the border between Poland and Ukraine. Uh, we've been watching as vehicles at the border um, have, have piled up, uh, come and gone, the, the backup there um, as it increases and decreases. And we can actually watch that over the course of the day. So here you're seeing a single day uh, of activity at that border. And you can see some of the collections that we collected that day uh, at 916, 1120, uh, 1516, and 1829. Um, and you can see how we're collecting both in the morning and later in the afternoon. In fact, that afternoon shot, uh, it's, it's actually getting quite dark uh, at the time. So you're not just seeing what it looks like at these two times during the day. You can see it throughout. You can look for changes, and you can keep an eye on things throughout the day. And of course, this same capability extends beyond a single day. Uh, you can monitor this border continuously uh, for, for months on end. Um, and then you can pull this out to understand, OK, what's traffic like at 9 AM? What's it like at 6 PM uh, and everywhere between? OK, so changing gears a little bit, now I want to talk about some of our commercial applications uh, where we're seeing uh, demand for dynamic monitoring of commodity flows in particular. Uh, as I mentioned, our proliferated sensor network can collect um, images all over the world. Uh, and with the revisit rate that I was talking about up to 15 times a day over most of the planet. Uh, so to really take advantage of that dawn to dusk persistent monitoring capability, we've set up a collection deck that is taking images over many of the world's major uh, supply chain nodes, commodity hubs, um, and points of economic significance. You can see some of the, the stats on the left uh, around the oil and gas terminals that we're imaging, major ports around the world, both, both commercial and military, uh, mines of different types, uh, iron ore mines in particular, coal mines, um, refineries as well, uh, and doing multi-sensor 
analysis of those refineries with some other data that we can bring into the mix. Uh, power plants, the same, using um, this, this uh, additional data, like data off of the VIRS sensor, for example. Uh, and then airports, as I showed earlier, we're monitoring airports and, and military airfields around the world. Um, every day, all day, running these AI analytics against them to understand what's changed, what hasn't changed, uh, what are the basic patterns of life at these facilities, and when can we identify um, changes to those patterns of life. This is also occurring all over the planet. So we're not just doing this in one location. A lot of the examples I'm showing today show one location, but every time I show one of those examples, just think Black Sky's doing this all over the planet. Um, that to me is where this becomes really interesting from a developer community perspective. We're collecting tons and tons of data, uh, and these aren't just static maps. This is dynamic imagery. This is imagery over the course of a day, over the course of a month, over the course of the year, and you can really see changes as they occur. Construction, uh, projects as they're laying foot after foot of foundation. You can watch um, in near real time as that occurs. You can also see where infrastructure investments are being made, where there are delays, where there is crumbling infrastructure, and all of that you can see from space. Uh, there's a ton of applications that are in this data uh, that are to be unlocked by the developer community. Um, and that's why Black Sky offers tasking APIs and archive APIs to be able to access this data programmatically. Uh, as well as access to our artificial intelligence capabilities uh, through APIs. So let's dive into a couple of these uh, examples here. The first one I'm going to talk about is import-export terminals. Uh, so Black Sky does a lot of port monitoring. Uh, here you can see an example of a port in Spain uh, that we're monitoring. The first thing I'll point out is that our artificial intelligence is identifying all of the ships in the image. Uh, it's also generating these precise outlines of the ships that helps with identification and verification. Um, we also bring in other data sets like AIS in order to identify the specific uh, um, identifier of each of these ships, the maritime identifier. And then we can correlate that with the measurements that we're getting from the ships to make sure it is the, the ship that it's claiming to be. Um, and then we also are measuring things uh, the, like these economic indicators like coal stockpiles. So how much coal is present uh, in these stockpiles. On the bottom right, you can see an image from Dalrymple Bay Coal Terminal. Uh, this is some of the 3D data that we're able to derive from our imagery. One of the uh, ways that you can task our satellites is something that we call stereo collection mode. And this will actually take two images at um, different angles, different observation angles. And from the difference in those observation angles, you can derive 3D information about the scene. And from that, you can back into uh, volumetrics around these stockpiles to understand exactly how much coal is located at this terminal. Um, you can do the same thing at coal-fired power plants to understand how much coal is present uh, at a power plant. Um, and, and we do this as well with, with other commodities such as iron ore. Um, so being able to do this is, is powerful, but again, this isn't a point in time estimate. We can do this over and over again throughout the day. And because of that, we can stack up an understanding of how much iron ore is present at any given time. Um, and then we can carry that forward over many days, weeks, months, and then start building pricing models on top of that uh, based on the supply that we're seeing. This is really important for building robust prediction models. If you're relying on a handful of images, you have really very few statistical guarantees that that data is going to be representative of the ground truth of what's actually occurring at that facility. Um, for all you know, the moment that that satellite image was collected, a ship had just left that carried off a lot of that coal, and more coal was coming in behind it, and you just happened to get an anomalously low volume of coal, and because you've only collected a couple images, there's no way to determine that. On the other hand, using Black Sky's capability, we're collecting throughout the day uh, multiple days in a row. And so if there's an anomalously low volume of, of coal, for example, uh, during the time of one collection, the other collections are going to let you know that um, this was just a, a point in time and that the actual trend is, is different. Um, so by relying on this type of data, our users are able to build more robust models, more reliable models uh, that are using more statistically significant samples uh, of these measurements. Similar to the coal measurements, we're also able to measure uh, how much of a petroleum product is present in these floating top uh, oil tanks. So here you can see an example um, in Rotterdam of some of these tanks. Uh, 
based on the solar illumination, you can actually measure the shadow lengths of each of these tanks and then back into an estimate of how full these tanks are. Uh, and you can do that programmatically uh, to gain an understanding of how much um, of this petroleum is present in each of those tanks at any particular point in time. And then again, carry that analysis forward in order to understand uh, this storage uh, at this particular facility in Rotterdam. Then you do that across many, many facilities and you start mapping the regional supply of petroleum. You start matching, uh, mapping the, how does the regional supply compare to another region's supply and how do the prices between those two shift uh, as one increases or one decreases. So being able to do that in a statistically significant way with the data that we're able to provide really allows you to have more confidence in what your models are producing, have more confidence in the decisions that you're gonna make, um, all relying on this rapid revisit data, which again, a couple images, um, even, even a couple images a week are not gonna allow you to do that. This is a really cool example uh, that's combining multiple data sources uh, in this case, what we're doing is actually we're trying to maintain custody of particular ships. So uh, maintaining custody just means keep track of. We just want to keep track of where these ships are. Um, and what matters to us here is uh, we're tracking barges that are carrying a certain type of liquid commodity that one of our customers really cares about. So what we can do is, is we can say, okay, we're going to pull in AIS data, which gives you ship positions at any given time to track these barges that we care about. Um, the, the liquid commodity that we are interested in is only carried on a particular type of barge, so if we can track that barge using this AIS data, problem solved. Well, the issue is that these barges are not self-propelled, so they don't actually require AIS, and so we can't track them through AIS. We don't know where they are at any given time. Okay, so how can we solve that problem? Well, these barges, since they're not propelled, have to be propelled by a tug, and those tugs are self-propelled. They do require AIS data, uh, and so if we know which tugs we want to track, then we can track the barges. So that sounds good. Uh, but the problem is that there are only certain types of tugs that can tow these barges, but those tugs can tow just about anything else. So now we're back to an issue. We can track these candidate tugs, but we don't know whether they're carrying the commodity that we care about. So the way that we dealt with this was by building a completely automated system to track the position of these candidate tugs and then any time they approach the distribution plant for the commodity that we care about, we're gonna have our system automatically task our satellites to collect an image. And the idea is that if we can collect an image of that tug as it enters the distribution plant and get that image before it leaves, we can get eyes on to verify whether the barge that it's towing is the one that we actually care about. So here you're seeing this system work. Um, the green lines here is the actual position of the ship as, or of the tug as reported by AIS. And then our AI system is automatically tasking images uh, when these tugs enter certain what we call geofences or areas around these distribution plants. And you can see in the call out box there that we actually imaged when the tug arrived. And then we're able to verify whether that tug is towing the right kind of barge, the barge that we care about. If it's not, then we mark it as um, as not, not towing the, the barge, and so we don't track it any further until it arrives at another distribution plant. But if it is carrying the barge that we care about, then we flag that, and then we're able to track it forward. So now we're able to use the AIS data because we've confirmed that that tug is towing the right kind of barge. And so you can see here that we have events in our system that are, are alerts to our customer that, hey, we saw this tug arrive. Uh, it's been verified to be carrying the commodity that we care about, and we saw it depart. So this is a fully dynamic, fully automated system that's, that's responding in real time to the positioning of assets and making these verifications that yes, this is, this is the barge that we care about and now I'm able to track where are all these barges at any given time. Well, I have a system that's tracking the tugs and making those confirmations and so at any given time I can actually verify um, and get up an up-to-date list of the position of all these barges. That helps me then measure how much of this commodity is flowing between the regions that I care about and allows me to make pricing updates based on that. So all of this stuff in commodity flows is super interesting when you consider the fact that this is all occurring in near real time. So historically, if you wanted to look at this stuff, you're waiting for these companies to publish maybe in their earnings reports how much of this they moved. Maybe you're getting signals somewhere else. 
um, that might be aggregated at a weekly level or, or maybe even sometimes daily. But here you're able to see the movement of these commodities um, down to that kind of hourly level. And that then really lets you make decisions way faster than the competition. You can get out in front and you can make confident, informed decisions uh, because you have eyes on and you have verification. So a lot of this that I've shown has been uh, monitoring these sites, running some analysis on the images that have come in, tracking assets as they're moving around. One thing I mentioned at the beginning is we're monitoring many of these facilities uh, throughout the day. We're monitoring them with analytics enabled, so this AI system that's uh, creating these derived um, products off of the imagery and telling us where various assets are located. What we can then do is, is create an end-to-end -end automated site monitoring service. And what this really allows us to do is understand activity at a site at a very deep level in a way that would not be enabled by typical remote sensing systems. So we're gonna look at how we monitor sites for business insights uh, and decision making. So here we're looking at an airfield uh, where we're able to identify the particular runways uh, as well as aircraft that are stationed on these aprons. And because our system is aware of this site, um, it, it's aware of where the runways are, it's, it's able to automatically identify all the aircraft, our system is actually able to issue runway alerts whenever it notices aircraft are taking off or landing, um, when aircraft are present on the runway, taxiing, things like that. Um, this is a, a pretty incredible capability for maintaining situational awareness of activity at airfields um, across an entire region or around the world. You can get actual alerts sent straight to your dashboard that say, hey, I just saw aircraft taking off from this airfield, you may wanna check. And then, hey, by the way, a couple hours later, aircraft landed at this other airfield. Um, so being able to do that level of analysis is really key to many of our customers who wanna be able to understand how things are changing around the world throughout the day, uh, but don't wanna have to pile through um, pixel after pixel after pixel uh, uh, looking at all these images. When you consider that we're taking images at that kind of hourly cadence, you start building up hundreds or thousands of images over a single site. That takes a lot of time to pour through and understand everything that's changing from image to image. That's why our customers rely on this AI system to go through and tell them the key indicators there. But that's thousands of images over a single site, now you look at, okay, I'm actually monitoring hundreds of sites or thousands of sites, and the problem just grows um, from there. So being able to bring this in line with our artificial intelligence to offer this end-to-end uh, -end automated site monitoring service is a key advancement in this industry uh, because as you increase that temporal resolution, as you're getting more and more images throughout the day, making sense of all of that really becomes a big challenge. Uh, it's one of the reasons we had to show a video earlier today. Uh, we collect so many images that you need to turn it into a video. You can't just place it all on a single image. It's, it's too much data. Um, so I'm gonna dive through a couple examples of how we offer site monitoring as a service and some of the insights that you can pull, pull from this system. So this first image is from Haneda Airport in uh, Tokyo. And what we've done here is we've been imaging this, this airport for quite some time. It's a commercial airport. Um, there are international terminals here. There's domestic passenger terminals here, but there's also maintenance hangars as well as cargo areas. Um, and so what we've done is every, for every image that was collected, we ran our AI on it and it identified all the aircraft in the image. Uh, even the aircraft that don't have, for example, their ADS-B transmitter turned on because uh, the aircraft is stationary. And what we were able to do from that is then correlate that data with our understanding of the facility. So we built a map of the facility that identifies all of the different parking spots at the facility and maps each of those parking spots to the, the functional use of that spot. We then aggregated all of the aircraft observations to build a map that shows where aircraft are typically stationed, where aircraft are typically parked. So any of these green parking spots you're seeing, we very rarely see aircraft positioned in those spots. But any of the red parking spots uh, are typically uh, full of aircraft. And so when you take a look at, for example, the West Cargo area, you can see all of these red parking spots that are out front of the JAL operated cargo terminal. Um, and then from those red parking spots in the actual base image, you can see that those are all full of aircraft. 
that's not actually unusual for this location. Those parking spots are red, so we expect to see aircraft there. But in the parking spot to the left of that, I believe it's 41, um, that's a green parking spot and there is an aircraft there, that's actually more unusual. So now we are starting to build in an understanding of what's typical and what's atypical, and sometimes that's not obvious from just a single image. If you just looked at this single image here uh, that's underlying all this data, you might think that those parking spots that each have three aircraft backed up in them um, is, is completely unusual, but those parking spots are usually actually occupied. Um, instead, the, the aircraft in 41 is, is more anomalous. And then, of course, you can make determinations based on uh, the volume of activity between the JAL and the ANA uh, terminals, how much cargo is moving through each of those terminals. Similarly, on the right, you have JAL maintenance terminals um, for maintaining aircraft. Uh, and then on, so on the left of the maintenance terminals, they are, there's JALs, hangars, and then on the right is ANA. And once again, we can start to look at how typically are aircraft parked in front of these maintenance hangars. Uh, in this case, we see a few red spots in front of JAL and mostly green in front of ANA, which is an indication that maybe JAL um, is doing more maintenance work on their aircraft uh, than ANA over the period that, that we were observing. Again, this type of information is only possible when you have many, many revisits so that you can start building up a statistically significant sample. On any particular image, you could have had any combination of activity uh, that, that falls somewhere on the distribution of what's normal. But when you aggregate it, you start to get a better sense of what's typical and what's atypical. The last example I'll leave you with is one of our port monitoring solutions where we're doing something similar. Now we're looking at berth occupancy. So how frequently are these berths occupied? How often are, are uh, bulk, uh, bulk cargo ships actually positioned at these berths? Um, before I dive into that, one thing to note is that this is Port Hedland. It's one of the major iron ore exporters around the world. Um, and it's not actually operated by a single pr um, uh, carrier. So you have operators in here like BHP, uh, FMG, RHI. And so what we've done is we've gone through and we've broken down who operates out of which uh, berth. From that, we've taken all of the images we've collected uh, over this uh, particular port. Um, which was 548 images over the course of one year. Um, and then we ran, uh, well, when each of those images came in, our AI system identified the ships that were in there, and then this is an aggregate of that data. So in this particular case, uh, we're able to associate how often um, ships were present at each of those berths, at each of those slips, uh, and then aggregate that over time to get what we call a berth occupancy rate. Then from each of these uh, berths, we can aggregate it across the company. So if you see BHP here has the highest berth occupancy rate at Port Hedland um, out of all of these uh, other operators. So this type of analysis, again, is only possible by bringing all that data in together. We bring in AIS to do this analysis as well. Um, and then we, of course, as I mentioned earlier, can do stockpile analytics against these uh, particular iron ore facilities. So we can also measure the supply side, how much iron ore is present uh, in each of these stockyards, which gives us both demand from the ships arriving and, and taking iron ore out of the facility and supply uh, from the iron ore actually coming from the mines. So this type of analysis uh, is, is really quite powerful. But again, it's not just one facility that we're doing this. We're monitoring over 9,000 sites, 500 plus of these major ports, both uh, commercial and military ports, and giving these intraday updates uh, really is really powerful for a lot of our users. And again, there's simple API integrations to this so that you can reach into our, our uh, intelligence database and pull out what you need for your application, be it imagery, be it analytics or derived insights, uh, you can pull that in and ultimately monitor the global GDP all from your web browser or through a simple API interface. Uh, so with that, um, I thank you for your time um, and look forward to connecting with some of you. If you are interested in working with any of Black Sky Services, please reach out. Uh, we, are, we believe that this is a, a very large and growing market of dynamic monitoring, and this is where the world is going. So if you're looking to be at the forefront of that, please reach out to Black Sky, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you.